Welcome back, everyone, to our Traveling Through History series. Today, we will continue reading from Richard Holmes' The Napoleonic Wars. And we will start with Chapter 6, Egypt and Syria. Secure in his domination of Italy, Napoleon turned to the Mediterranean and Egypt in a campaign intended to throttle Britain's eastern commerce. In 1797, Napoleon dominated northern Italy, returning to France after peace was made with Austria at Campo Formio that October. He was lionized in Paris and was delighted by his election to the Institut de France, a learned society comprising five academies, including the Académie de Française. Although he had little time for the directors, he agreed with them on one main issue. The directory was anxious to humble Britain, whose Prime Minister William Pitt was seeking to assemble a new anti-French coalition. Napoleon concurred. The British were scheming and active, but if they were destroyed, then Europe is at her feet. Given command of the Army of England in 1798, he decided that invasion was impossible without control of the sea. He concluded, however, that the capture of Egypt would be conclusive enabling the French to invade India or to lacerate the commerce upon which Britain depended. How this could be accomplished in the face of the British Royal Navy was never adequately explained. With the expedition almost ready to leave, relations with Austria worsened, and Napoleon pressed the directors to send him to dictate harsher terms than those previously imposed. When they balked, he set off for Toulon, and on the 9th of May, sailed aboard Vice Admiral Bruyere's flagship La Orient. His squadron part of a larger fleet of over 300 vessels carrying almost 37,000 troops. Napoleon paused to compel the surrender of Malta and fortuitously eluding a British fleet under Rear Admiral Nelson, began to disembark his army at Marabout Bay on the 1st of July. Exactly a month later, Nelson returned to find Bruyere's fleet in Abukir Bay, and destroyed it at the Battle of the Nile. Napoleon would have to fight with his lines of communication severed. On the 2nd of July, Napoleon's troops seized Alexandria, and he then set out on a desert march towards the Nile, which brought his men to the edge of mutiny. The Mamluks, ruling what was in theory a Turkish province, sent a detachment forward while the remainder concentrated near Cairo, Napoleon reached the Nile on the 10th of July, and on the 13th of July, there was a battle between French and Mamluk flotillas, won by the French when the opposing flagship blew up. The decisive clash came northwest of Cairo on the 21st of July, known as the Battle of the Pyramids. Murad Bey's cavalry charged the French, formed up in great squares, and were beaten off with huge loss. Napoleon entered Cairo two days later. On the 11th of August, the Mamluk survivors were defeated at Salaya, and Napoleon told the Directory that the country is under our control and the people are becoming used to us. In fact, Murad Bey fought on, and Turkey's declaration of war inspired a rising in Cairo. The Turks, encouraged by a British naval detachment under Commodore Smith, prepared to counterattack, and Napoleon never one to wait passively, set off to the Sinai in February of 1799. It took 11 days to take El Arish. Gaza fell without resistance, and Jaffa was stormed on the 7th of March, in a victory marred by the butchery of the town's garrison. Acre held out under Jezer Pasha, encouraged by the arrival of Smith and reinforcements. Kleber, marching inland, smashed the Turks at Mount Tabor on the 16th of April, but the siege of Acre stalled, and in May Napoleon decided to fall back. On the 25th of July, he beat a Turkish army landed by the Royal Navy in Abu Bay. But the Directory had concluded that Egypt was no longer important, for Pitt had assembled a second coalition. Napoleon sailed for France on the 22nd of August, leaving Kleber in command. It would be two years before the survivors return home.
we will now enter into chapter 7, Brumaire and Marengo. If it had not been for you English, I would have been Emperor of the East, lamented Napoleon in later life. British sea power may have wrecked his Egyptian adventure, which achieved none of its strategic objectives, but the evidence of French ambition actually hastened the formation of the Second Coalition against Napoleon. Although the expedition diminished the Directory's stature, it enhanced Napoleon's. His unexpected return in October of 1799 affronted the Directors, who gave him what he called a glacial reception. But coming just after the dispatch announcing his victory against the Turks at Abu Kir, it delighted the public. And Napoleon's journey from Freus to Paris was accompanied by wild enthusiasm. Napoleon reappeared at a crucial moment. Massena had just defeated the Russians in Switzerland, and an Allied army would shortly be driven out of Holland. Royalist members of the Council of 500, the lower house of the legislature, had been expelled in 1797, and counter-revolutionary revolts in Brittany and the Southwest had been suppressed. Although the Council's extremist neo-Jacobins aired the old revolutionary rhetoric, the capital's appetite for violent politics seemed sated. Yet if France craved stability rather than more revolution, the status quo offered few attractions to ambitious generals. There were private tribulations. Josephine's spectacular adultery with a young officer, Hippolyte Charles, had exacerbated Napoleon. And on his arrival in Paris, he'd locked her out of his bedroom. Josephine and her children, Hortense and Eugène, noisily beseeched him to show mercy. Napoleon eventually opened the door and their union was not again troubled. But Josephine now found her husband less pliable, and insisted that she break with her louche friends in the directory crowd. Napoleon worked covertly with political supporters to develop his own role. Some, like Sies, wanted the executive strengthened at the expense of the legislature, and needed a general to stage a coup. You want power, said Foreign Minister Talleyrand, and Siez wants a new constitution. Therefore, join forces. Napoleon's brothers Joseph and Lucien intrigued, and on the 25th of October, Lucien became president of the Council of 500. On the 9th of October, also known as the 18th of Brumaire, an alleged conspiracy provided the excuse to move on the two legislative assemblies, the Council of Ancients and the Council of 500, to St. Cloud, outside the capital. Given command of the troops in Paris, Napoleon harangued 10,000 soldiers into Tuileries Gardens. On the 19th of Brumaire, Napoleon went to St. Cloud, but panicked when confronted by furious deputies. Lucien told the soldiers that the deputies sought to murder their general, and Marat, who had commanded the cavalry in Italy and Egypt, led them forward. They burst into the chamber, and by nightfall there was a three-man provisional executive dominated by Napoleon. A new constitution was ratified by plebiscite in December, with Bonaparte as first consul, Cambaceres as second, and Lebrun as third. His political power secure, Napoleon turned his attention to military affairs. The French faced one large Austrian army in the Black Forest, and another on the Upper Danube, with a smaller force in Italy. Napoleon compiled plans for an advance on Vienna, but the Austrians launched an unexpected offensive in Italy, and in May of 1800, Napoleon took his army over the St. Bernard Pass, reaching Milan on the 2nd of June. Determined to bring General Melas to battle, Napoleon was caught off balance on the 14th of June when the Austrians attacked part of his army at Marengo. He sent a desperate message, Come back, in God's name, to Dessa, who arrived in mid-afternoon and declared that the battle was lost but there was still time to win another. As his infantry counterattacked, the younger Kellerman charged the Austrian flank, and within minutes, the Austrians collapsed. Marengo did not end the war, and it took Moreau's victory of Hohenlinden on the 3rd of December to persuade the Austrians to sign the Peace of Lunaville on the 9th of February, 1801. Britain agreed to terms in October of 1801 and confirmed them by the Peace of Amiens in March of 1802. Napoleon, both victor and peacemaker, was appointed consul for life, the sole head of the state, on the 2nd of August.
We will now move on to chapter 8, Ruler and Lawgiver. As emperor, Napoleon remodeled the French state, sweeping away the feudal vestiges of the old regime and bestowing on France an efficient bureaucracy and a single code of law. In 1803, the Vendean leader Georges Cadoual planned to assassinate Napoleon. The plot failed, and as persis- and as the plot failed, and its participants were executed. Although Moreau, the victor of Hohenlinden, against whom evidence was weak, was allowed to go into exile. To underline the seriousness of the regime's response, the young Duc de Anjan, heir to the Prince de Condé, head of a collateral branch of the Bourbons, was kidnapped from the German state of Baden, brought back to France, and shot for being an emigre in foreign service. All this helped create the climate in which the Senate, gently prompted, proclaimed Napoleon emperor on the 18th of May, 1804. The customary plebiscite confirmed his elevation. To win the Pope's approval, Napoleon went through a religious form of marriage to note Josephine in private, and when he was crowned on the 2nd of December, he was anointed by the Pope, but placed the crown on his own head. Napoleon had already begun the reconstruction of France, he emasculated the representative institutions he inherited with a senate, a legislative body, and a tribunate. The latter abolished in 1807 for venturing mild criticism. The executive, in contrast, was strengthened enormously. Most ministries had been reorganized after the revolution, and under Napoleon there were logically divine ministries of the interior. Foreign affairs, finances, justice, war, marine, and the colonies, and police, with a state secretariat to coordinate and direct policy. There was, unsurprisingly, neither cabinet nor first minister. The Council of State was the most influential new institution. Its members were chosen widely from distinguished men across the political spectrum. It prepared laws and regulations, formed a reservoir of senior officials for special tasks, and subjected ministries to expert supervision and review. These supervisory duties eventually led to the creation of a corpus of administrative law, and the council was to develop into what one historian called the unshakable cornerstone of French bureaucracy. Powerful central institutions controlled local administration. Authority in a department lay in the hands of its prefect, appointed from and answerable to Paris, whose uniform betokened his status within a disciplined hierarchy. His subprefects, less gorgeously uniformed, were often local men, but had no electoral constituency, and like their master, were the government's creatures. These arrangements in part harked back to the intendance of Louis XIV, but the fact that the revolution had felled a forest of medieval survivals permitted comprehensive centralization that the old regime, hedged about with feudal relics and customary laws, could never have achieved. When central government was strong, the new system worked well, but in his desire to destroy local power, Napoleon removed regional counterweights to instability at the center. Replacement of the varied laws of France by a single code had begun under the old regime and continued with the revolution. Napoleon accelerated the process in 1800 by giving a group of distinguished lawyers five months to sort things out. It took until 1804 for the code to be agreed, but such was the measure of its success that all 2,281 articles could be contained in one volume. The code enshrined equality before the law, religious toleration, and the rights of property, which was to be inherited equally by all legitimate children. The Code of Civil Procedure was more complex, and although the new criminal code seems draconian to modern eyes, it was a good deal more reasonable than, for example, British practice at the time. Napoleon's concordat with the Pope in 1801, which enabled the latter to anoint the Emperor at his coronation, accepted that Catholicism was the religion of the majority, but placed bishops under prefectural control and paid state salaries to the clergy. Monastic orders were allowed back into France, but papal bulls could be published only with governmental assent. 
Although the church retained control of primary education, the new secondary system focused on elite laissés, boarding schools whose uniform pupils were destined for the most important posts in the bureaucracy, backed by secondary schools whose education fitted pupils for lesser commercial and administrative positions. There were specialist, higher schools for education, medicine, pharmacy, law, and the army. Napoleon's administrative and legislative achievements outlived him, and many are reflected in France today. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Tune in next time, where we will enter into Chapter 9, Ulm and Austerlitz. See y'all next time. Take care.